All right, if you're a longtime listener of my podcast, you know I'm a gigantic fan of this fella, not just because he hails from the banks of the Three Rivers. Nay, it's because he is one of, if not the finest storytellers in the world of sports media right now. His latest is just right up there among the best of work that I've really seen him do, and that's uh, not also because it happens to focus on a Pittsburgh Steelers because it's gangbuster stuff about one of the more complicated souls that we've seen in uh, in pro football. Terry Bradshaw going deep on HBO premieres Tuesday, February 1st at 9 o'clock, and then it's streaming on HBO Max. That's the 21st century way. It's our pal, the executive producer, the director, all things over at NFL Films, the best in the biz. It's Keith Cosro. What's the poop, fella? How are you? Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, Yens heard about talk. Roethlisberger. He retired, Yens. I yeah, it's been dusty in my in my house for about a week. <laughs> you know, wanted to go down there, blue lose down there south side, and uh, throw a couple back. But you know, I'm I'm in, stuck here in a blizzard in South Jersey. Couldn't even get back to Pittsburgh. Dude, it was a long wait between Bradshaw and Roethlisberger. What we's going to do now? We're going to be a going to be a lean lean decade or three coming up here. You know. Hey, we're we're back in a desert. It was 20, 21 <laughs> year walk in the desert the last time. We all know the names: Stott, Malone, Woodley. Oh, I, oh you oh you know what? I, I I may have met my match here. I could probably reel off every guy. Oh, know, I got them all: Stout, Malone, Bobby, Scott, Woodley, Hull, Scott Bobby. Campbell, Tom Zach, then O'Donnell, O'Donnell, Tom Zach, Cordell. Kent Graham for a minute. Jim Miller. Jim Miller for a half. Um, and then uh, Tommy Matt. Then Cordell came back. Tommy. Th Tommy Gunn. Touchdown, Tommy. I was there the day he came in in 2002 and took took over for a struggling Cordell to the delight of the of the faithful at Heinz Field. I was there too. How about that? And it, oh, it was a funny. Day. People were chanting XFL and they beat the Brownies. Mm -hmm. Last yep. second field goal, right? And then, and then Ben in two thousand four. I don't think it's going to be that longer. Right? Oh wait, we'll get to that. <laughs> I want to talk modern day QB and and what it means and what we learn from Bradshaw and what it tells us about current quarterbacks and eternal quarterbacks and all that. But let's talk a little bit. Well, you know what? I'm sorry. The you know we have to. I, I have to ask this if I'm talking to you over at NFL Films. A great in season. Indianapolis Colts hard knocks, compelling stuff, obviously. Um, who's hard knocks August 2022? Come on, do Dan Campbell. He likes to bite people on the knees, he says. Do do the line. <laughs> we will see. The uh the Lions are 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 eligible, as has been reported. Um, I, I believe the Jets are eligible, um based on the, the rules. Um, but we look for a volunteer first. Um as as Mike Tomlin would say, we want we we want volunteers, not not hostages. Um, hey, you gotta get Tomlin in there. That'd be he'd be good at that. No, yeah, I think I I'm just gonna weigh in. You do what you want. I I know you and your pals will come up with a wise decision, the best path forward. But my two cents is Robert Sala sounds like a platitudes guy, and I think a month's worth of that'll get tired. I don't think we need to hear him like men. Outstanding day of practice. It's about one two. I think we're going to get a lot of that. I think I, I think Campbell. Well, actually, he'll say those things too. But somehow it'll be funny when he does it. So I vote for the the, the Detroit Lions. Allow you, that to put that up on the board. Damashek votes Lions. Damn it! I will. I'll tell the fellows. I'll tell Ken Rogers, the czar of hard knocks, and uh, you know it's it is a process. Um, and now that there's an in season hard knocks, and and yeah, we're really proud of of the Colts uh, season. We an amazing, really, it was an amazing. That was an amazing documentary too. And as it is, not for Colts fans, but for the objective football fan, the after Jags loss, not surprisingly, was the most fascinating of them all. It's just so stunning. I could, like we at no point in that week did we ever think we're making the finale of this season. Hmm. It just never – it wasn't like – I mean, we talked about a couple things, and we had the senior director, Steve Trout, go to Indianapolis early Sunday night just in case, like, the unthinkable would happen. And we 
we we laid some things down with Matt Conti, the the really great head of PR with the Colts. So we we had, but we didn't actually think about it. We didn't clear the commercial music that you would normally clear for the sad, stunning ending. Just wasn't in anybody's scope yeah. that that could happen. And then it happened, and at, at four o'clock that Sunday, I couldn't even enjoy as a Steelers fan what the Steelers mm-hmm. were doing in Baltimore because I had four hours of emergency phone calls to try to figure out oh, how, we gonna, I, I am how we going to land this plane now, guys. Oh my God, this is unthinkable. It was it un- is one, unbelievable. It is one of the sad ironies of working in sports is that sometimes sports as a job takes you away from sports as a fan and you don't and like wait i miss that because week 18 let me tell you in hindsight cosro one of the all-time most enjoyable uh, days and it does all start with what i have called and i don't want to be prisoner of the moment the single worst regular season loss i think i've ever seen given the stakes for the colts and the foe that they were up against of course they were going to beat the jaguars and they got they didn't lose they got hammered and the day after stuff that you get with Reich and everybody else, it's it just feels so empty when he's standing at the podium. We're going to get better from this, and we got to learn. Like, are you, though? Are well, you, though? It suddenly feels so empty, and so, I'm sure that's how Mahomes and Josh Allen and everybody else are feeling the last I, uh, few days. I think it drives home how hard this is. It really is. And 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 how even the worst team in the end, yeah, it's no joke. The NFL is, like, it's set up to be even. It's not set up like mm-hmm. baseball – it's not set up like the N- like the NBA, where usually the team with the best player wins. These teams in the NFL, the talent levels just aren't that different. It's about coaching and preparation, attention to detail, and ha- your quarterback being on top of his game and everything else. And so we see it all the time. We've just never seen it in that spot where a team needing to win and get in loses to a 2-14 and 14 team. It just was... Well, I mean, uh, uh, something that I've been mentioning quite a bit in this last month is as these huge stakes games come up in the quarterback league and people like to push back and say it's not just about the QB, it's a team game and all that, but it it does matter obviously who your quarterback is. The the results speak for themselves. Which teams and which QBs keep getting to Super Bowls and playing in these big spots. And now all of a sudden, Patrick Mahomes uh, in his ascent and I would have said that and and now it's kind of a curious thing to ask prisoner of the moment if Patrick Mahomes just decided you know what I don't like all this noise about my fiance and all you know what I'm done with football I'm bored of it and I retire I think he'd have a shot at getting elected to the Hall of Fame I I know this is crazy because it's hypothetical it's not going to happen but if he did retire I think he doesn't get in today but if he had won on Sunday, he would get in. And these games, you just never get back. It really comes down to like three or four games in one's career and how it defines them. And as that connects to Terry Bradshaw, the thing is, as we talk about the paradox of the man and the football player and everything else, this is a good place to jump in on the guy. The thing I say all the time is, clutch as we perceive it is elevating one's game. But in fact, it's really maintaining the high standard that you set over the course of the regular season in your career and maintaining that when the stakes are biggest here, Mahomes clearly dropped off on Sunday in the, in the second, uh, second half and in overtime against the Bengals, Terry Bradshaw, again, silly man. He's a, you know, passenger lucky to be on that team and everything else. His, his uh, yards per attempt, his yards per game, his QB rating, go up demonstrably in the biggest of spots against the Dallas Cowboys and the Minnesota Vikings and the Oakland Raiders. It's funny to hear him talk about, I wish I would have gotten more respect like Staubach. He beat Staubach head to head twice, two and oh in the big game. I wish I was more like Tom Brady. It's sort of sad that he on some level doesn't get credit, right? On you know, two years ago, we did the NFL one, the NFL's 100 season. We did the NFL's all time team, right? 100 greatest players mm-hmm. in NFL history. And we did, there are 10 quarterbacks on that team. And Bradshaw's not one of them. And Staubach I is. voted for him for the record. I, vo- I, I voted yeah. in that. And and, yeah. and and I did obviously vote for number 12 there. And I just want to make it clear. And he, you know, he just missed, obviously. Um, and, and I, I think his his legacy is so complicated 
because how many Hall of Fame quarterbacks, and he says it in the film, if I played today, I'd have been out of the NFL in three years. Mm -hmm. I'd have been a total bust, and they wouldn't have had the patience, and we see it every year now. Half the guys picked in the first round flame out, and so much is dependent on who your coach is. Like, look at a guy like Justin Fields. He's already going to be on his second coach in his second year. Trevor Lawrence is going to be on his second coach in his second year, and you, you hope that whoever the offensive coordinator is, whoever the head coach is, is able to shepherd them along the way Andy Reid did with Mahomes, the way, you know, and some guys just have it, Mahomes, Burrow, Herbert. I mean, these guys are – they're special, special talents. Mm -hmm. But some of them aren't ready on day one. You know, Aaron Rodgers sat for three years. And we don't know what Trey Lance is, right? No idea. He might come out next year and be the MVP. One of the no. more fascinating storylines that's emerged is that they go up to get him. And this this Kyle Shanahan, I love coaching Jimmy G. You didn't love him so much that you didn't go out and find his replacement because you saw limitations on some level in Jimmy G. So, yeah, it, it, exactly. The, the, the Chargers drafted Phillip Rivers when they had Drew Brees on the roster. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's why is it so hard to identify quarterbacks that – the, the smartest football men in the world fail every year and they fail to coach them up and they fail to get them ready. And then you see Patrick Mahomes, the very best who has never had one bad moment in his postseason career, a little shaky, maybe in that Super Bowl last year, but he was missing, missing both offensive tackles. So right. you, you got to give him a pass and he's playing an incredible defense yesterday from the time he threw that interception at the end of the first half to the end of the game, we saw the, a version of Mahomes we really hadn't seen before. It I cannot get over. I, you know, I like the decision. If we want to get into in the weeds here a little bit, I don't want to spend too much time because I want to talk about um, you know the the legacy of Bradshaw and how it applies to to you know his peer group in the 21st century. But I, I thought the play call was great. I thought that was a fine last play at the end of the first half. I like philosophically going for it because the game's over. A touchdown there, and it, and there's nothing that the Bengals say in the locker room that allows them to rally back. That, those points would have been significant. Yeah. But also, if Andy Reid doesn't burn a timeout on the first series challenging the spot, he has an extra timeout, and they probably have their cake and eat it too. Tyreek Hill doesn't score. Okay, now we kick the field goal, and the margin point. is 14, and then we see how the rest of the game breaks there. But as it is, uh, you know, a, a, a real all-time stunner that that offense hanging 21 on the Bengals like they did. And the Bengals are not a world beater defense that they scratched out as a little, they didn't get to a hundred yards in total offense in the second half that Mahomes and, and he's the driver and he kind of flopped and, you know, Tony Romo keeps bringing it up. And I wonder how much you encounter this, obviously in the seat that you fill quarterbacks, and coaches and otherwise trying to stiff arm the notion that single games or these little stretches uh, define one's legacy. No one wants to own that because the stakes are great. If you lose, it's pretty severe. But do you believe what Tony Romo keeps bringing up to his credit as a high end quarterback who didn't get to the Super Bowl that these are this is what defines you? This is, you're the quarterback. This is what defines you. Do you? pick up on that consistently that it matters greatly. You feel that from Bradshaw I, 40 years after the fact, how much he cared about those victories. I think yes and no. The, st the stakes of these games are what make them so, so compelling, right? It, well, I mean, it's one thing to get six great games in a row, which the football gods blessed us in ways that we'll be thankful for forever here these last two weekends. But Legacies are going to be defined, no doubt, if you succeed. If you fail spectacularly, that's going to harm your legacy. But I do think that Dan Marino, somebody like him, is able to transcend the fact that he did not walk away with a ring. Like nobody, Dan Marino's on that 100 greatest list, and he should be, because anybody who ever watched Dan Marino play knows that he's one of the 10 greatest quarterbacks in the history of football, and 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 that's not up for really debate. But Terry Bradshaw, who had a spotty first half of his career mm -hmm. and who didn't statistically measure up with a lot of these guys, threw a touchdown pass in four Super Bowls in the fourth quarter and 
led two fourth quarter comebacks in the Super Bowl and went 4-0 and in the Super Bowl against some of the greatest teams ever assembled and beat the Raiders in championship games in Oakland. And he, the, the way that Bradshaw was able to deliver in January certainly defines his legacy, certainly elevates him, and certainly merits him inclusion in any discussion of the, the greatest players to ever step on the field. He earns it. He deserves it. And it is crazy that he does view himself. I mean, it is, he, it is one of the more powerful moments in the film is that he says, you know, I wish I was loved and respected the way Brady and Manning and, and Staubach are, and, and I'm not, and that's okay. But boy, it's such a revelation that, yeah, that, it, that does impact a guy like that. I don't know if it would impact all of them. He's, he's a unique soul. He's a sensitive soul, Bradshaw. Well, I do. Yeah, that's what the, that's the the next question I have for you. I keep going back to the word paradox because that's what he is. He's dumb, but he called his own plays. He's the last high end quarterback to do that. He's a hero for all of time in pigskin. He vanquished the Dallas Cowboys, America's team, Roger Staubach and all that. But he was so emotionally brittle that Hollywood Henderson saying he couldn't spell cat if you spotted him the CNA and Burt Reynolds doing shtick in a in a variety show and Jimmy Kimmel in a pregame show really hurts his feelings and, and that he concedes that. Is that a rare trait in the high end QBs you've dealt with over the decades? Well, do they do a better job of, of masking how, how hurt they are by what outside noise is or is Bradshaw just a, a rarity that he allows that to insinuate itself into his ego? Well, let's think about it because we know Michael Jordan never forgets anything anybody's right. ever said, right? And we view it as like, you know, it, it, it's a meme from, from the last dance, right? And I took that personally. And, mm -hmm. and we know Tom Brady is, is similarly competitively driven. So maybe they're taking the same thing and internalizing it in different ways. But maybe that's what Bradshaw did competitively. When he was playing, he did have the opportunity to take the slights and 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 turn them into competitive fire. You know, he he kept his mouth shut about Hollywood Henderson all week before Super Bowl 13 and then went out in the field and, and kicked his ass and 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 won MVP of the game. And in in one in one of the all-time greatest Super Bowls, one of the greatest games ever played against well, like you say that maybe the greatest Super Bowl to this day. It's in the conversation at least, but to your point, that game doesn't even include he, is, he was the only guy until Kurt Warner did it in, you know, round turn of the millennium. He was the only guy to ever throw a, you know, a deep ball like that in the fourth quarter to, to, to take the lead. And he did it twice. He did it in Super Bowl 10 and he did it in, uh, in Super Bowl 14. And in 14, there were two bombs to Stallworth because right. the second one wasn't a touchdown. Catches over his shoulder, right. And both those throws and all the throws to Swan in Super Bowl 10 and, and the, and the, the, the one we always see to Swan in Super Bowl 13 coming right at you in the back of the end zone. Every one of those games, he made a play. Super Bowl 9 to Larry Brown, fourth quarter. The Steelers had – no, Pittsburgh had the ball. And now Bradshaw would throw it to another world championship. For Sanda <laughs> and Spence and oh, Sable, I mean, the best. And uh, But I – I know I'm genuflecting to you here, but I, and not just because uh, you've given us the time here. I really do. Uh, the storytelling here, it's, it's old news that NFL films and Keith Cosrell are great at telling stories, but this was a different kind of storytelling. First thing that jumped out at me right out of the gate when you start watching this thing is obviously you have him doing his kind of variety show in, in, uh, in Branson and all of that, but you intercut the interview that you do with him has an uncomfortably tight shot. And right out of the gate, you feel that it's different because you went so tight and it's really raw that he gets choked up continually throughout your conversation with him. That right, right out of the gate, that's, that was obviously a conscious choice to give him no wiggle room. The camera's dead set on 72 year old Terry Bradshaw's mug the whole way. Yeah, we, we, we were conscious about that. And, and certainly you don't want to, frame someone in an unflattering way um but we did we 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 viewed it like this you know and this isn't rocket science but everything you saw on the stage we had we had seen the stage show and we were aware of what was in it and that he 
it's a biological, it's a biographical story on the stage mixed with him singing songs. I'm glad it um, wasn't biological. Yeah, it's not that biological. could have gotten creepy. That could have gotten yeah. weird. But but it's it stays light. He keeps things light on the stage. Mm -hmm. And we knew that there was more depth. So we looked at it as like tip and iceberg. And we were gonna do these interviews with him in the Clay Cooper Theater in the dressing room. That's where we want like we wanted the whole film to live in this theater. We and maybe it was crazy. We were going to the Branson, Missouri for 10 days. And I, the first call, the kickoff call we had with HBO with all their executives, I said, we're going to, we're going to go to Branson, Missouri, and we're going to make a really weird Terry Bradshaw movie. And it, and it, and I didn't mean it like, oh, it's going to be like, you know, some, you know, we're not making a David Lynch movie here, but, but it was going to be something different. And we were going to go shoot the whole wad of the budget in Branson. And we were going to come home with our movie. And, and we just felt like he's one of the few athletes in American life who could narrate his own story, who can tell his own story and have you riveted for an hour plus. He's such a gifted storyteller. So the way we set it up was we did three interviews with him in that dressing room over the course of the week. And it was a small dressing room. And yeah, we shot it with three cameras. The main one was right down the barrel because you want that that confessional quality when he's telling you mm -hmm. his story, you want him, you want him addressing camera. And then we had one, the third one, the one's off to the side, shows a little more of the dressing room. The third one is really tight. And we didn't know how much of it we would use because you don't know how deep he's really going to go here. 20 minutes into the first interview, the first day, um, he brought up his divorces. And, and right then, you know, he, he had said to me, I know, I know what we have to talk about and I'm going to do it, but I don't like it. And I'm not happy about it. But he, once he decided to do this, he was going to go all in. And so 20 minutes first interview, I mean, that, that's like, I don't, I'm saving that one for day three. Like, I, you know, mm -hmm. who wants to ask somebody about their failed marriages? That's I not, like that he calls, I like that he calls Jojo Starbucks as though he doesn't really have any connection to her. And I don't get any sense that he did. It was a, you know, uh, two ships passing in the night for a few months that he's like, Jojo St Starbucks, the figure skater. Like he, yeah. <laughs> he has to identify yeah. her for himself as much as anybody else. It is, <laughs> it, it, it is a, a, such a strange thing. And I, so I so he brings it up and I said, um, well, can you, you know, give us a little thumbnail of the three marriages and what happened? And, and he just went for about 10 minutes straight and most of it's in the film. Um, and it was, it's, stunningly raw and real and he bears his soul and and i think that's like a that's a that's a gift to us when somebody who's had that magnitude of success in life whether it's in sports or anywhere else reaches a point where they're comfortable enough with what they've been through that they're willing to share their struggles in a way that that is obviously painful it's obvious that he's in pain throughout and we used bits where he says i'm not comfortable right now this is hard for me i need a you know can i get some bradshaw bourbon you know that there, there's several moments throughout the film where he almost has to just stop because it's too much and there were times where we had to pull back a little because all right he's got a show to do later tonight let's not and i don't want to send him down a rabbit hole that he can't mm. come back from because he does battle depression and this stuff is really hard for him and the scars he bears from the time from the time in Pittsburgh, which is so hard for any of us to grasp, are real. They're real. He's got a lot of pain, and it's very difficult for him to talk about that part of his life. He doesn't like to talk about it. It makes it, it really is something to kind of experience because from the outside, of course, he should be in heaven. What a life, as he says, and he ultimately seems aware that you know. Um, you know, was it Sinatra or was it Paul Anka who wrote My Way? Either way, it's like regrets. I've had a few and it seems like at the end of it now, at the coming up on the finish line of his time, sort of, and reflecting on it, he gets that he's lucky in a lot of ways. But, you know, well, just from a football perspective, I love the idea that his idol was Joe Namath, the, you know, from our neck of the woods, you know, not too far from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Beaver, Beaver Falls, Falls. Where, where, where my mother grew up. 
that he goes that Joe Namath goes down to the deep south of Alabama and Terry Bradshaw goes from the deep south Louisiana to Pittsburgh and that they intersect and you have that it really is a, a super satisfying I don't want to tip too much about anything but that at the very end you show that he got to laugh it up with with Namath his idol and he got to laugh it up with with Brady and you almost feel like you know it's bittersweet I hope Bradshaw is lucid about the fact, as he says, how lucky when, at the end of it he is to have done all this. But you talk about the divorces, the divorce from from a football fan's perspective, or I guess the rocky marriage that existed while they were winning four Lombardies in six years was with Chuck Knoll. It's not a secret that those two didn't get along. Is there any comparison that you can think of between two guys, uh, you know, Brady and Belichick, didn't seem towards the end there to be seeing eye to eye. And, and, and that's how that resolved itself. But were there, I, I, can off the top of your head, I was trying to think about it where two guys were just at such odds in terms of just basic personality types and yet put it together and had that level of success. Well, I think this is one of those where in some ways it's, it's partially the way Terry processes things emotionally. I think if we look at all of the, Legendary coach quarterback duos, Walsh, Montana, um, Belichick, Brady, obviously, Landry, Staubach. I think the relationships are probably closer to what Noel Bradshaw was. Oh, really? Huh? And people realize, and I'm not saying Bradshaw's blowing anything out of proportion at all. I think Noel was really hard on him, and Bradshaw merited a lot of criticism and hard coaching those first few years. I mean, you know, when you get – when you take a safety in your first three games of your career, you're going to get coached hard. I mean, now um, from a football nerd perspective, I thought I knew all <laughs> things Steelers. I didn't know Terry Bradshaw took a safety in his first three starts. I mean, that's some crazy stuff. You got to try to do that almost. And people don't realize he lost his job the year they won their first Super Bowl. Joe right. Gillen had the starting job the first six games and was th- airing it out. And Bradshaw was ready to go and no one wouldn't trade him. And he ended up putting him back in and, so, yeah, it was more volatile, and Noel was tough, and I don't think Noel was personal, but neither was Tom Landry, and neither was Bill Belichick, and neither was Bill. Bill Walsh tried to replace Joe Montana for the whole second half of his career. Mm-hmm. He had a guy sitting looking over his shoulder he couldn't wait to put in and kept putting him in when Montana was at the height of his powers. Well, so I you, think know it, I love, you know I love my what-ifs. If the catch is dropped, by Dwight Clark in the 81 title game. <laughs> I suspect there's no, there really isn't that much success. That's what one magic season that ends um, without getting to the Super Bowl. I think you can rewrite it. And in fact, I've done that with, with Baldinger and company to have that what if conversation. I think he does move heaven and earth to get Dan Marino in the draft a couple of years later, if not mm-hmm. trying to get Elway when Elway mm-hmm. wants out of Baltimore. So I, I think history is very, it's one of the, not just because it vanquishes the existing NFC dynasty of the Cowboys with Danny White trying to move it forward into the 80s. It really disrupts football history about as much as any single play did in the well, Super Bowl era. Here's one thing that the Brad, doing this Bradshaw film made me think about a lot is we put, so much on these guys who are often in their early to mid twenties. Hmm. Think about where you were and who you were like after you got out of college and became like an independent adult those first few years. I mean, I was, I, I mean, I couldn't have, hand, I couldn't handle anything. Mm-hmm. It was a, all I could do is get to get to work and pay my, my rent, you know, and my car insurance. That was like huge victories. And we're asking these guys who are – look at these quarterbacks in the AFC right now that are all under the age of 26. And we expect them to be fully formed, like responsible, mature, leaders of men, capable of performing at the, at the height of their powers under the most intense pressure with the entire world watching. Oh, and then off the field also be perfect. You know, don't ever make any mistakes. This is it's what we ask. It's much worse now. It's much worse now than it was like, back then, right? Oh, yeah. And you can say, oh, well, they get paid, you know, look at what Mahomes is making, 300, whatever, how many hundreds of millions of dollars. 
that doesn't make it easy. That in fact makes it harder. And we ask, and Bradshaw is, is, is the most obvious example of, Hey, let's all just, just give it a minute. They don't all, we don't all arrive as fully formed, mature, responsible adults. And for many of us, it takes decades after adulthood to reach that place. And that with Bradshaw, I think what's really neat about this film and, and why the film doesn't dwell on the Noel relationship for too long. Like you could do a whole film, Noel and Bradshaw, sure. and we've done it and other people will do it. But we were really um, intentional about not making that the whole film here, not letting that relationship overwhelm them. Cause this is a film that's about Terry and how he's arrived at the place he's at now, because I think at age 72 or 73, he's finally a fully formed person who's comfortable in his own skin and, and, and has, you know, he's, he's, he's been through all these battles. He's battled depression and he understands that he has ADHD. Could you, here's a, what if, what if we knew about ADHD in 1970? Well, what yeah. if Terry Bradshaw got to take uh, Vivance like my 12 year old gets to do, you know, so he's not bouncing off the walls in school all day, you know, may like maybe it's a whole different career. Who knows? Well, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And I suspect that to your point about the, the Noel Bradshaw relationship, Bra you know, Bradshaw's kind of like, I didn't go to his funeral and that's it. I don't know why people worry about it. I think Chuck Noel I think he would probably be, if confronted with all this stuff, probably would have been like Don Draper in the elevator with his young colleague. Like, I don't think about you at all. Like, I, I bet you Noel's like, what? I had no, I, I, I really didn't know it was it was this bad for you, Terry. I, you really get that in, in those moments in the final seconds of the Super Bowls and you have some shots of that, you know, Noel kind of tries to hug him a little bit. He wasn't a per terribly personal guy, but he's kind of like, we did it. And Bradshaw's like, whoa, 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 friend. You weren't nice to me. You get that vibe in those in those moments where they're not even mic'd or anything that breaks through. What would you say then to because as a storyteller, we've had the conversation a, a couple few times that NFL films turned football into cinema and made it popular. There, that you could make a case that gambling matters and fantasy matters and all that kind of stuff. But NFL films probably deserves the the top line credit for popularizing pro football more than anything else did and having it rise above um, the other professional sports there. And then around the turn of the millennium, you guys realize now we've got to go in reverse instead of turning these people into superstars into you know, stars of the silver screen, we have to get inside the helmet and get to know them a little bit. So as you sit here as a storyteller, you love the candor of Bradshaw, but would you advise... I don't know, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, or anyone else, or any kid who's, uh, you know, going to get drafted in a couple of months, would you counsel them on how to comport themselves when the mics are hot and when the cameras are rolling? Is there, uh, is there some strategy if you were, because I imagine you'd be a great PR guy or a publicist guy at this point, like here's what you do do if you're a quarterback and here's what you definitely don't do. I think the guys that make it, like we had Justin Herbert on Hard Knocks his rookie year. And I remember the first time I saw footage of him in camp throwing a football saying, oh, my God, this guy's going to be a like superstar. I, this, mm. the, and you could you could tell by just the way that all the people in the Chargers training camp were, were, taught, were reacting to Herbert throwing the football, even as Tyrod Taylor's backup. And I, I think he what I would say to any of them is just you just be you. Just don't try to be anybody else because no, nobody's going to buy it. That everybody sees right through a BSer. And I think and that's kind of true, but you don't want to be your complete unvarnished self. Look at Baker Mayfield. I feel like he did that and I fully support that. And I loved his swagger and chip on the shoulder for that town who is a punchline as a football town and beyond. I thought that worked well, but now he has announced I'm off social media because it creates too much heat. And certainly if Terry Bradshaw would have said, um, that really hurts my feelings. You can really get under my skin by calling me dumb. Well, then that would have 
whoever told him before Super Bowl 13, don't ever say publicly that that bothers you because it will only exacerbate it. And you're here yeah. every week. I, I, it, it's curious because I, I'm with you completely. I want to hear the unvarnished feelings of well, these guys, but it, but then it creates enemies and creates bulletin board stuff and all that kind of. Well, kind being of you doesn't necessarily mean be outspoken. It means if that's who you are, then well, first lead with your play. You know, first establish your greatness, and then the rest will follow. Right, like. If people have a problem with Baker Mayfield, it's probably because they see him, you know, on commercials at every commercial break. And then they, the game comes back on and he's and he's struggling. And it's why is he, you know, I think we struggle with that as fans and we and we mock it, obviously. Um, he's really good in those commercials, too. He, he, he's good. Commercial. He, you know what? He's you're, so you're, good. You're exactly <laughs> but, right. He is. But, you can't deny it. But look, Joe Burrow's cocky. Right, Joe Burrow's got as much drip as any quarterback that's walked in the league in decades. He's got a swagger about him, and he saw the chain he wore to the game yesterday. But I mean, he's the subject of of derogatory memes today. If he throws three picks in that game, that's the difference. Is that he? You buy it though. To your point about authenticity, I you just buy it from five miles away that he's the real deal that you know he's going to do it, that maybe they aren't going to win the game, but you buy that he's not nervous or or the moment's not too big for him or any of that. So maybe the answer is the first, the first order of business is winning your locker room and earning the respect of your teammates with your authenticity. Because maybe that's what we saw last year with the Chargers when we did hard knocks was that Herbert won over that whole organization, the coaches, the players, everybody before he ever took the field in the regular season when Tyrod Taylor had a freak injury, but right before a game. And I think Burrow, like we got guys in his in their second year. We had Mike Hilton go leave the Steelers and go to Cincinnati because of Joe Burrow. And, and Mike Hilton doesn't even play on the same side of the ball. Hmm. You know, and the Steelers couldn't sign Hilton because, because they had the pandemic cap issues, but you had people flocking to Cincinnati because they just know. This guy's going to win Super Bowls. He's special. He, and and you hear probably from other guys around the league, what's he like in the locker room? And they say, no, he's the real deal. And I think Mahomes is the same way. I think Josh Allen, look at the way Josh Allen has won his locker room. And they all have different personalities. There's no one right way to do it, right? You do it by being yourself, by leading with your play, by earning the respect of, of the guys in the locker room. And then everything else flows from there. It feels so like that, that's say- probably the formula. Well, so as we connect that to Bradshaw, do you think that these high-end guys, because Aaron Rodgers to me for, you know, 12 years now has always struck me as just a different cat than than these leader of men kind of guys like Brady or Favre, and those are two very different souls, but they, they do have that kind of quality to them where Rodgers is more subtle and he's more sarcastic and everything else. But would you say that Bradshaw is unique among these um, the quarterbacks who, who've achieved as much as anybody, you know, in, on the short list of uh, most accomplished quarterbacks. Because to me, by the end of it, you feel like, man, I can't imagine that this is the kind of stuff that goes on in the head of I, blank high-end quarterback. Well, that's why I think it's such, I think it's worth watching the film because yeah, right. there aren't many people. And that's why it was really important to us to make a film that, spanned his whole life because that's the arc here right it's not mm-hmm. his it's not his football career it's not his relationship with Noel. it's not his divorce it's all of it you know it's his it's his tv career and his movies with burt reynolds and it's his four marriages and it's everything because i i don't think there are many people who could overcome abject failure on a public stage for several consecutive years it went on for a long time. He's drafted in 70. They get to the Super Bowl season. in 74, right. And the Immaculate Receptions in 72. It's in the middle of that. But he, you know, they weren't winning because of Terry. And he still got benched in 74. So nobody knew if he was the guy. And he's hum- he's being humiliated. He's being booed. He's being called an idiot, you know, in a town that he hate, that he doesn't want to be in. He's a small town Southern kid. And in the hub of the Rust Belt, which at that time was a very different place. How many people have the timber to 
overcome that? You know, how many of these Hall of Fame quarterbacks went to that depth before they rose to the top of the mountain? It's a great because, question. I guess because, Plunkett, you know, I mean, who suffered that long before they broke through? Alex Smith, I guess. Not, I mean, not not to the degree either of those names as Bradshaw's success, but right, great point. Plunkett, yeah, Plunkett flamed out, but he, he didn't succeed like Bradshaw succeeded, but he won two Super Bowls. You know, that's about it, right? How many of yeah. these guys really do it? And that's that's an example we can all learn from and 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 take inspiration from. And you look at Bradshaw, you're like, that guy won the lottery of life in every possible way. World class athlete. From the word go, he's setting like national javelin records in, in high school, Terry Bradshaw. First pick in the draft, wins four Super Bowls, marries an Olympic figure skater, five movies with Burt Reynolds. 30 years in our living rooms every Sunday when he's not tending to his beautiful ranch in Oklahoma. And you're like, what does this guy have to complain about? Right? Well, a lot, I mean, not complain, but there's a lot of struggle and we all, nobody's exempt from it. So that goes back to that kind of tip and iceberg idea that we wanted to present kind of, here's the Bradshaw that, we see on Sundays on Fox, here's the Bradshaw that, that he presents when he does his stage show or that when he shows up and he, and he shows his butt to Matthew McConaughey in a movie. But there's this other, there's a whole lot going on beneath the surface there. And, and it's worth learning and understanding. And we should be thankful. We should be grateful that somebody like him is willing to be an open book like this and share his story. There's a moment in the film um, that I think is it might be the most important moment in the film where a guy in the audience stands up, a veteran. Yeah, well, he's got his, I, he's an old guy, he's got his veteran's hat on. Right, exactly. Somebody who says, you wouldn't expect saying this, right. Stands up, says, I've been struggling with depression for 50 years, and I just want to thank you for, for speaking about it publicly and being so open. And it, you can just tell it's honest, it's heartfelt. And, and I think Terry has learned that over the last several years, that since he started talking about depression and, and the things he's battled, that it's made an impact. You know, he gets stopped by people, by grown men, you know, who don't cry and said, thank you. You know, you're, you helped me. And I think that's why he does it. Well, I mean, you know, listen, I could talk to you forever, by the way, another football nerd thing I picked up. I knew that Calvin Sweeney caught the touchdown pass in, uh, in Shea stadium in Bradshaw's last game against the jets. I didn't know Greg Garrity. Those are the two names, the two guys who caught Bradshaw's last two touchdown passes, Greg Garrity from Penn state and Calvin Sweeney. That's crazy. I, You're right though. Like in the film, what you see is what you see. I mean, you see it come to life in, in Pittsburgh terms, Steve Blass was doing the same thing at the same time, which was just, you know, Steve Sachs before Steve Sachs or Chuck Knobloch or these, these implosions that emotionally it becomes too much and they crumble. Bradshaw couldn't literally hold the ball. I mean, you forget when you see them strung out, the ball would just fall out of his hands and stuff. This is the number one draft pick and that he overcame that in relatively short order. And then is the Super Bowl hero down there in new Orleans against the Vikings a couple of years later. You're right. It's remarkable. I guess it would be like Mitch Trubisky. Yeah. Mitchell right. Trubisky right now going on to win four Super Bowls. Right. That, that would be like a guy, like that was the, le like Trubisky is, hasn't looked like the part, right? Since he got to the NFL. Bradshaw didn't look the part the first four years. You were like, what, what do they have here? Like, like, obviously a gifted thrower of the football, but he has no idea what he's doing. We better get, you know what? What we got to do is we got to get Bradshaw together with Tristan Jari to make sure he has overcome his failures and can eliminate them from his memory so that we have a brighter springtime on the there's, banks of the three rivers, right? There's no failure like a Pittsburgh Penguins goalie meltdown in, in the, in, in the postseason. For, for all the, and as Pittsburgh Penguin fans, we have no leg to stand on complaining about anything. Hey, cause, just, right? We're in good shape. Don't believe the doom and gloomers. But, We're in good but, shape, man. man. We got a draft. When a Penguins goalie flames out, I still have nightmares about Tom Brady. Barrasso, 65 footer from David Volek in, in the spring of 1993. I was, I was, I was there for that one too. I was there too. You so, were in the building for that one. You were in the igloo. 
I, was I remember in, the flower imploding was, against the Flyers a decade ago. Um, what, what are you doing? I'm not here for this kind of jive, Cosro. I want to celebrate something I, here. These are good I, times. You, you brought it up. You're right. I did. <laughs> I, I, I have to own at least part of this. Um, okay. Two more questions and then you go about your day and celebrate your great success here with the, with the new, new documentary. One, one more thing about Bradshaw to talk it kind of addresses how self-aware he is to the point of it being detrimental. Has any superstar athlete ever worn a toupee in the prime of his career? I've talked to Terrell Davis, which I think is fascinating stuff. If you go back and watch the original broadcast of Super Bowl 32, the two key figures of that Super Bowl are Davis and Brett Favre. And they're both brace faces. The Super Bowl, it's the biggest game. And they both are doing interviews, have braces. I said to Terrell, they too late, man. Get your teeth fixed either before you make it to the big time or don't do it. Now it looks weird. And he said, well, I needed to get my teeth fixed. And you can't argue with the results. But Bradshaw walking around with a toupee. We know what you look like, bald man. What are you doing? We, no, you're not fooling anybody. He was getting paid for it. He had a big oh. endorsement. He had a, it's one of the stories it tells it didn't make the film and in stage show he talks about the he was getting paid I think six figures and then he, <laughs> went, he went golfing one day and it was too hot and he had the toupee in his back pocket and somebody <laughs> saw him there and he lost the endorsement deal because he wasn't he wasn't wearing it yeah you see him in those movies with the toupee with Burt well I mean Burt Reynolds was probably owned the toupee company that that endorsed him. But the, yeah, I don't know that there's been a more, I mean, we don't do that anymore, right? We shave our heads. No, yeah. Mount Rushmore, the Mount Rushmore of toupee wares, I think would go Bradshaw, Shatner, Reynolds, Marv Albert, right? So you got to go down the hall here. My, my colleague and, and our executive producer at NFL Films, Pat Kelleher, is the czar of toupee identification. He views himself as, as the world's foremost authority on identifying a toupee. All right, we'll and, deep dive on that. that yeah, we're gonna, well, next time we'll bring Kelleher into the conversation. Please do. Please do. That, that would be satisfying for me. Um, and then last thing is to put it into some historical perspective, because few people care about the history as much as uh, as I do. And, and what the I, it is a weird thing, though. You as a guy who is on the other side, it's uncomfortable to ask people like, oh, you're never going to get over that one. Are you, Josh Allen? Like you never get that moment back. And that's why it's I think humanity requires if you're talking if you're tony romo or jim nance or al michaels or whatever like you try to soften the blow for these guys like hey nothing to hang your head about like they're gonna be right back like there's no guarantee of any of that and that's why like patrick mahomes now the conversation is already like he may just be a one and done qb maybe he'll never get back to the super bowl and you can't argue your way around like he'll definitely get back there they only give out the one lombardi that's why it's so fascinating for all of us. One thing Josh Allen gets to take away from it, though, is that he didn't lose that game. True enough. True he enough. did everything a player could possibly do to win a game. So you get, you do get that, but that, I mean, that, that small consolation. But you're right. I mean, Mer nobody thought in 1984 when Dan Marino walked off that field and uh, in, in, at Stanford Stadium that he was never, he was never going to, Set foot on the Super of Bowl course, field again. Of course, nobody Aaron thought Rogers. that it was his second year. Aaron Rodgers is worse because Dan Stunning. Marino, man, Dan Marino's best shot at the Super Bowl ended when they lost to the Patriots the year after that Super Bowl. Super Bowl twenty should have been Marino and company playing the Bears, and I think Marino and company would have beaten the Bears again on the fast track at the Dome, just like they did in the Orange Bowl uh, five six weeks prior. Um, However, that's pretty much Marino's best shot for the rest of his career. Rodgers has been all around it for a decade. And now I don't know how you reconcile that as a Packers well, fan. If you're if, if that 30 years now, you have the same number of Lombardis from Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers as Trent Dilfer and Joe Flacco in Baltimore. It's weird. I'll take it back to Bradshaw. The, the first playoff game I ever went to was that San Diego game in 19. I was there for that one, too. Yeah, we're the you know, we're doppelgangers, Danishek. You know this. We're weird. The the, uh, the when he threw and that how much is that pass like Favre's interception against the Saints when Favre right. took the Vikings to the championship? I hadn't watched that play in so long, and I'd never we'd never used the network broadcast before like we did in this film, 
hits against his body, terrible ill-advised throw, turns into the game-clinching interception against the Chargers. When Bradshaw made that throw, he didn't think that was the last playoff game of his career. You don't know when your last one is. You don't know. Aaron Rodgers, to lose three straight championship games like this, oh, it's got to just kill him. I can't wait to see where he winds up. A fascinating storyline, obviously. Last thing then, historical perspective, we swoon over Allen and Mahomes in the divisional round. Where does that one rank for Keith Cosrow all time, or at least in the Super Bowl era? All right. As you I, know, I disregard everything that happened before the Super Bowl era because that was when the sport was in the minor leagues. So right after the game on my family thread with my my best friend from, from Pittsburgh, Mike Maglin, and my brother and my dad, I say that that might be the best playoff game ever played. And they settled down. You're an emotional guy. And I said, well, wait a minute. I, yes, I'm an emotional guy. I also was the guy that produced uh, NFL 100 two years ago with the 100 greatest plays games of all time. So l- let's look at the list. So we, we spent some time this week looking at the list. The best games I've ever seen in no particular order have to be Super Bowl 49, the Seahawks and the Patriots. Oh, we agree. That I mean, is the most – that that the most underrated the game in NFL history. Most okay. underrated. Start to finish, historical stakes, no dead spots in the game. I don't like a dead spot. The Steelers-Cardinals Super Bowl, which I would also put on this list, has a very weak third quarter. Not oh, yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely right. Spot. Just that. De- now you get in the conversation when you have two of the ten greatest plays in NFL history in one game. That so that game transcends. Obviously, sure, it's the great single greatest drive ever. I mean, talk about yeah. hyperbole, uh, but it's a, that's the greatest the James drive Harrison put together play. by anybody, right? And and Larry Fitzgerald, but playing the greatest football that you can play. Everything about that game was special. Super Bowl twenty five. Another start to finish Giants yeah. Bills, just a, such a special football game. The, the one people forget about that I can tell you're not going to bring up is Niners Ravens. That's the most forgotten great That's Super Bowl. That one game. has so many great big plays in it and big I swings thought, and the blackout I was in the, and everything else. I was in the stadium. I thought it was a terrorist attack for sure. <laughs> I was in the stadium. Was, is there anywhere was, you and I haven't been at the yeah. exact same time? I, you, I, I looked around. I was like, guys, we got to plan our exit strategy. 20 minutes in, my wife's outside smoking a cigarette with David Arquette. She's fine. She comes back in. <laughs> Everybody's like, relax, go get a drink. But that is it. That was, but that was a game. That was a blood. So what I don't like, and I, the games that look like they're going to be a blowout and then the other team comes back. That you lose points on my list. I want. I don't know who's going to win this game, and I don't I know. I hear you. Like, like that game was a blowout, then the blackout, and then the momentum swung. The twenty-eight to three game. A lot of people cite that the Brady Atlanta game. It wasn't a great game for three quarters. It was garbage. The Patriots and, were off. and it's not Brady's best performance. If in no. fact Brady is done playing football, people will hold that one up as his greatest performance. I say it's Super Bowl 49 because the Seahawks had the best defense of the air and they were down 10 points in the fourth quarter and he rallied. Oh, incredible game. And and then the, the Colts-Patriots game in 2006, that AFC Championship game is a special game. Great. When the Colts finally vanquished Brady, and- Manning gets a Super Bowl. Great game. The now I don't the game I don't I don't remember the catch game but that game is great start to finish the game I oh, do go remember back and wa- go watch the, that one man that's, that's, that's oh, yeah, the, remember, as yeah. good a game as you'll see great game and the tra- obviously the Chargers Dolphins game is the first football game I remember watching we were in Boca we were in Del Boca Vista at my grandparents' house me and my brother watched that game <laughs> jumping off the walls. What an incredible football game. And I don't rem- – obviously, we weren't alive for the ice ball, and we should never forget the ice ball because the conditions, the stakes, the level of play, the way it finished, the way the guts of Lombardi and Star to finish the game the way they did, the ice ball should always be at the top of anybody's list. And the greatest game ever played, I, I don't know if it was – I think it. I think it got that moniker, so it's remembered in that way because it, 
it, it invented sudden death over time, right? Right. It's it's important in history, and it makes pro football popular on a grander scale. It's not that the, the game; it's a good game to watch, but it's not it's not as satisfying a watch as any of these. It's kind of like watching I Love Lucy. You know, like I get I get that Lucy a ball is really funny, but the episodes don't really hold up. But I see what's there. But it's been transcended by this point. But you're right. The thing that's great about the ice bowl and then them beating the the Packers then beat the Cowboys again, the following year on an interception in the end zone, the Cowboys win those two games again to get back to the stakes of these things. It's called, you know, it's called the, the Landry trophy, not the Lombardi trophy. The Cowboys win those two games and they lose two games on the last play of the game of both of them. And history is completely different. The Packers are the gold standard by the time we get into 1970 and the Cowboys have to still win one against the dog. Oh, it's, it's, I, I love talking about this stuff with you. So you go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm interrupting. So, yeah, but so, well, 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 let's bring it home now because this game last week checked a lot of boxes. This, this Bills Chiefs game, two, the two quarterbacks playing at a level few have ever reached for the entire game. No dead spots in the game. The whole game was good. First half was really good. Was it 14, 14 and a half times? Yep. All right, that was a really fun, entertaining first half. Third quarter, Chiefs go up a little bit. Allen uncorks a bazooka. That, Seven, that, that, that pass that's the play. Big. That's the one. It's like Gronkowski catching the touchdown pass towards the end up the right sideline in Super Bowl 49. It's from that moment that the game takes off. That's yep. that. But it was good. So it was a really good. You're like, all right, this, these guys are bringing it. These quarterbacks are. They're both such great athletes, and they they can convert a third down in a hundred different ways. Which to me is what the definition of what a great January quarterback is. Is can how can you convert a third down when I need one right now? Third and seven. Can I just give you the ball and say, figure it out? Go get me a first down. The the great quarterbacks who succeed in January, they convert the tough third downs. It's and a that, dumb, yeah. it's a dumb, very specific one, but I think you saw that on Sunday in SoFi. This is, you know, hu- bigger legacy game for Stafford than uh, than, oh. than Garoppolo for the Rams organization playing at home oh, yeah. with a chance to play a home Super Bowl than it was for the upstart Niners, given the way the season tracked and everything. And with all that hanging in the balance, Stafford drilled that short throw to Cooper Cup. On what was it, third and three, third and four? It's not a play that uh, will resonate for all of time, but but that nails throw and really tough grab on a heater going to Cooper Cup, the offensive player of the year. I mean, right, that that is a defining play if the Rams go on to win the Super Bowl. And even if they don't, I think Stafford now is in the Hall of Fame by virtue of getting to a Super Bowl. These are the, a lot of that the talk minor today. things. A yeah. lot of that time, and and all after almost throwing the the catastrophic interception, the next play he throws a deep hole shot, and and drills it. As Troy Aikman is saying, I'm not sure if he's injured. He's not throwing the ball well. Next play, how about a 25 yard deep out? Like boom, spot like, like a classic Matt Stafford throw. Like those are the moments. That's what we live for as fans. That's what. On January football, and it's, it's I could about, talk about it for another hour, damn it, Chef. I could too, Cosro, but I'm going to let you go and <laughs> celebrate yourself, and I'm sure you have a, a, a lineup full of interviews to do with fancy pants people and everything else, so we really appreciate you carving out. I honestly thought we would go about 15 minutes. I always do. I can't keep, <laughs> I can't keep um, control of myself. I apologize for that, but remember what we talked about. My early vote is for the Lions here. Now, if a team that resides on the banks of the three rivers somehow winds up with the quarterback of the collegiate team that plays in the same stadium as the Steelers or just did this past season, if eight is in black and gold, Kenny Pickett, now I think you got to do it. I think you got to tell the, I think you got to tell the Steelers, I'm sorry, it's your turn and we're taking you. And that's before I leave is what are your thoughts on, on Pickett? I, you know, it's funny that the um, that the conversation is uh, as we are in this point in the draft process where we're hearing a lot. It's not that he has small hands; he has some of the smallest hands we've ever seen for any high end quarterback. They're so so small, right? They're very small. I mean, I don't know. I, I just I can't reconcile small. how that really matters. I mean, I, I get how it matters in the foot, the NFL football, and everything, but 
I love it for like you. You have to appreciate for the story of it. It would, it would be better than this. And it's a make right. Um, you know, Goes back 40, to Marino, not, 40, not draft to Marino. Yeah, right, forty-one years in the making. I remember my old man who was a pit doctor fielding calls from NFL teams in the draft process. Like, what's all the story about that we're hearing about Marino off the field and everything else? And to his credit, the old man didn't say a word. Well, he didn't know anything. I'm not. I don't want to implicate the old man on either side of the moral ledger here. <laughs> Let's pretend I never said that. Um, but yes, that's right. I'm not, everybody in Pittsburgh, the pressure on Kenny, that's my only concern if they would wind up with Kenny Pickett is like, Dave should have drafted Marino, but now we're going to make it right now. Like Kenny Pickett has to now Dennis. become one of the five greatest quarterbacks ever yeah. to make this to is... make things right in the uh, in Yin's so, mind. Yeah, somehow uh, Kenny Pickett would have to bear forty the weight of a decision made by one of Art Rooney's sons forty years ago. That the most right. Pittsburgh nobody treats their quarterbacks. Quite like Pittsburgh treats its quarterbacks. But, yeah, we I mean, treated, we, I'll tell you this. We, we, treated we left Terry Bradshaw with so many scars, you can't go back to Pittsburgh. <laughs> well, I can't wait to watch the documentary <laughs> about Ben Roethlisberger in 20, 30 years that you're going to put together. Wow. I assume yeah. it's on the way. But, I mean, it's, you know, I, I do think it's, you know, in these trying to make sense of things and rooting for laundry and all that, I I, I will say as we say goodbye to a fellow Yinzer, we are lucky not just because we've seen championships and everything else. It is a cool thing, especially now in the 21st century, that joining Mean Joe and Bradshaw and Willie Stargell and Mario Lemieux and presumably Sidney Crosby, that another guy wore black and gold. And it's extra important because all three teams wear black and gold, so it breaks through more than it does in other sports towns, that we have watched these guys embrace uh, the banks of the three rivers. And I think that that's the takeaway. My story is, as people talk about these three-dimensional people, not the ones that we portray for three hours on Sundays that you guys have done so well for the decades, what you guys have evolved into on some level is the three-dimensional character. And sometimes it's uncomfortable to be cheering and all that kind of stuff. And people trying to reconcile, is it okay to root for this guy? Or is it, you know, should we be cheering for, for this or that? They are three-dimensional people, and and uh, never does that come through more clearly than when you're watching the, the Terry Bradshaw documentary. Going deep with number 12. Great work, Cosro, to you and the gang, per usual. But be extra proud of yourselves over there in, uh, in Jersey while you're trying to stay warm and out of the cold there. Thanks, buddy. It's great to talk to you again. And, A pleasure. Uh... The, se- the shame is, for for me at least, not maybe for the audience, but I could do another 17 hours of this without bad. Well, let's get together again soon. Let's do it. Let's get a big round table. Once again, Terry Bradshaw going deep on HBO premieres February 1st at 9 o'clock. But, of course, as I say, 21st century means you have HBO Max, right? So watch it at your convenience. Check it out. You won't be sorry you did. The great Keith Cosro, everybody. Thanks, pal. Thank you. See you.